Okay, back a ways in the year 1855, that's been a while, a 17-year-old boy named Dwight Moody left the farm. That wasn't for him, so he went to the city to either seek his fortune or uh, find a better life for himself anyway, and that effort did not go very well. The job was he didn't, that he was looking for did not materialize, so he uh, met with his uncle who owned a shoe store uh, and thought maybe he could find a job in that store. So the uh, uncle debated that for a while and thought, well, to keep Dr uh, Dwight off the streets, he offered him a job, but it was with the condition that he attend the Mount Vernon Congregational Church down the street. So Moody started attending church there as well and Sunday school. His Sunday school teacher's name was Edward Kimball. Well, Edward Kimball apparently saw something in Dwight Moody because that day Mr. Kimball came to the shoe store to call on him and he didn't stay in the customer area. He went right back into the storeroom and confronted Dwight Moody with the claims of the gospel. Well, that day Moody received the good news and he was never the same again and the world was never the same again. Today, Moody Ministries have a worldwide presence. Uh, Dwight Moody went on to found Moody Church in Chicago, uh, Moody Bible Institute, today Moody Radio, Moody uh, Press. And it was for one reason, and that is because a, uh, an obscure Sunday school teacher was faithful to confront Dwight Moody with the gospel. Dwight Moody, by the way, had a fifth grade education and very, very poor grammar. And I think that st stayed with him basically for the rest of his life. So today, we're going to talk about another confrontation, just like Dwight Moody was confronted. And that is found in John chapter 4. If you'd care to turn there, if you have the Bible along. If you don't have a Bible, you'll see them there in the rack in front of you. Those are the ESV version. You're free to use those. That would be on page 888. And if you don't have a Bible at home, feel free to take that home and read it. In fact, the Gospel of John would be a very good place for you to start. Read the Gospel of John and then start over and read it again. So uh, we are going to read this morning John chapter 4, verses 1 through 29 and 39 through 42. Uh, these are short verses, so it'll go, uh, go along rapidly. Okay, here we go. Verse 1, chapter 4. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus wearied that he was, from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you... A Jew asked for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, 
and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I, per I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So the central theme of the Gospel of John is Jesus is the Messiah. Another way to, to remember that is Jesus is God. Three words, very easy to remember. And that is reinforced in this John chapter 4. Well, most have heard of the Good Samaritan. I think you have, but John 4 is about another Samaritan. And in that particular time, clashes between the Pharisees and Jesus were frequent and bitter. So opposition was already growing to Jesus' ministry as we read here in chapter 4. And 4.1, the first verse, mentions the Pharisees, and we've heard that word, but sometimes I have to refresh myself. Who were the Pharisees anyway? Well, I have a Bible dictionary at home, uh, and it has pages and pages and pages about the Pharisees, but there's one paragraph that kind of defines it just a little better, and it's this, and I'm reading Pharisees means separated ones. The Pharisees were a party whose endeavor it was to live in strict accordance with the law, thus interpreted by the scribes, and the interpretation which they, that's an important word, they established, and to bring the people into a similar conformity. In other words, slavery to a set of man-made laws and rules, not the laws of Moses or the laws uh, given to Moses by God. The Pharisees were kind of a tightly knit religious party, I'd call them, or kind of like a fraternity, something like that. In Luke 11, Jesus said how the Pharisees loved the best seats in the synagogue and to be seen standing on the corner in their garb, praying loudly to make sure that everybody would see them. But really, Jesus said, they were full of greed and wickedness. In fact, they were hypocrites. They were somebody that presented one side, but they were something entirely different. There was jealousy. There was the jealousy the Pharisees felt also because of the large crowds following Jesus. It, I think it just drove the Pharisees crazy to see those large crowds following Jesus. I really do. 34 times these crowds following Jesus are mentioned in the Gospels. The Pharisees resented Jesus' popularity as well as his message, which challenged much of their teaching. Opposition to Jesus' ministry, as we said before, is, it was already underway. The Pharisees resented everything about Jesus, his ministry, who he was, where he went, who he is with, everything about it. In chapter 4.1, the, four, the Pharisees started the rumor that Jesus made and baptized many more disciples than John. And then in right away in verse 2, it said, no, Jesus wasn't doing the baptizing at all. It was the disciples. Uh, 
instead of engaging the Pharisees again, Jesus starts back home to Galilee. And the reason that he did that isn't entirely clear. Maybe he was just worn out. I think he didn't want to engage the Pharisees, so he was headed home to Galilee, up to Capernaum, maybe to rest up a little bit and, and uh, live to go out and witness another day. So anyway, he's taking off from southern Judea. There are three paths, not like the bicycle walking paths that we have today for sure. They were barely paths. One way was to go up to the west along the Mediterranean that way, straight through Samaria as the crow flies, like Jesus did, and then off to the east to cross the Jordan River and walk up modern-day Jordan to Galilee. Uh, today, it's so dry in Israel and the Jordan River, you could just about uh, jump across it. So uh, that's the way, the, the, if you're going from southern Judah to Galilee, those are the routes that you would take. So uh, anything to avoid the uh, hated Samaritans, that was the reason for going out around instead of straight through because uh, the Jews would avoid the uh, the. Uh, uh, Samaritans at all costs. And so why was that hatred? Why, why did that exist? Well, in 721 BC, the Assyrians conquered the northern uh, kingdom. And at that time, they brought in people from foreign nations to settle the country and, and foreigners from all over. Well, there were Jews there at that time. Some of the Jews stayed there. Some were deported. But the Jews that stayed there intermarried with the foreign people who were coming in. So when you get people together marrying, what do you get? You get kids. That's what you get. And, and uh, these kid, children were not of 100% pure Jewish blood. And that was the problem the Jews had with the Samaritans. The Jews who didn't intermarry, who remained pure Jewish blood, the ones who didn't intermarry felt betrayed by those who did, and so that made for even more ill feeling. Verse uh, 4 in the New Living Translation says, he had to go through Samaria, Samaria on the way. And we don't know, you know exactly why that was. He knew he was going to meet this Samaritan woman, of course, and maybe he felt duty-bound because of that. Jesus was heading into hostile territory, that's for sure. If you remember in Luke 9, uh, Jesus and the disciples were going into this Samaritan village to stay overnight, and they were turned away. And James and John says, Let's, why don't you bring down fire, and we'll just burn them all up. And Jesus said, no, I think we'll, we'll hold off on the burning up part of that. You know, I came to, to minister to all people. So as he went along, it was a hot, dusty day. Jesus sat down to rest. It was about 85 degrees. I know it was because I Googled it. So it's got to be true. It's got to be true. Uh, Jesus was tired after that 35-mile walk. He was, he was human too. And this well that we mentioned in our scripture was Jacob's well. Wells were usually located just outside of town, uh, kind of on the main drag, but outside of town. Genesis 33 says that Jacob bought the land for 100 pieces of silver, or about $800 today in, in our money. So it well, sounded pretty reasonable. A lot of history sur surrounding that well, too. Today, there's a Greek Orthodox church built right over the well. You walk into the church, and there's a well. Right in the middle of the church, that's something you don't see every day. So normally that, in that day, women, would it was their job to draw the water. I'd, they'd come early morning, a little cooler, or late in the evening, a little bit cooler. But this lady came at noon uh, in the heat of the day, maybe to avoid those people that knew her. She was a woman of fairly low estate, uh, reputation not the greatest. You could probably see her walking along with her shoulders maybe hunched over just a little bit and looking at the ground, not looking at anybody in particular. So as this, in verse 7, as this woman was drawing water, Jesus asked her for a drink. The woman was startled that Jesus, who she rightly perceived as a Jew, would speak to her, let alone ask for a drink. It was politically incorrect. 
The Samaritans were to be avoided at all costs. And in verse 10, Jesus replied to this Samaritan woman, if she knew about the living water, she would ask him for that. This story unfolds in stages, and somebody said this conversation with this Samaritan, unnamed Samaritan woman is like building a bridge. It's, it's built uh, in interlocking sections like this, in stages. This whole story takes place in stages. In stage one, the woman correctly identified Jesus as a Jew. And believe me, in that part of the world, they know who's who. They're, they're not going to make mistakes about it. So she identified Jesus as a Jew. Stage two, she then said, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? The woman said Jesus had two reasons not to speak to her. She was a woman and a Samaritan. In verse 11, the Samaritan woman then said, But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, and this is a very deep well. Yes, it is. They cleaned that well out in 1935, and it's 135 feet to the surface of the water. It makes my arms tired to think about pulling that bucket out of there with a rope, and you had to bring your own rope and bucket. It wasn't a community deal or anything like that. So anyway, this lady... This Samaritan lady was thinking of physical water and asked how this water could be better than the water that Jacob used. Water in the scriptures is a symbol of the cleansing of the soul from sin. Ephesians 5 says, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that she might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the word. And then in stage 3, verse 18, Jesus inquired about her personal life, which at that time and culture was unheard of. She'd had five husbands and now living with an unmarried man. So the woman tried to change the subject of the proper place of worship. If things aren't going your way, change the subject. It, it, you know, it's worth a shot. The Samaritans believed that the prophet of Deuteronomy would teach all things when he came. The Samaritan Bible contained only the first five books of the Old Testament. So the Samaritans actually worshiped the true God, but their failure to accept much of his revelation meant that they knew little of him. They were limited in their knowledge of him. And then verses 21 through 24, Jesus replied to the woman that there was coming a new age when the temple would not be physical, but within our hearts. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells within you? Second Peter, or 1 Peter 2, rather, And now God is building you as living stones into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are God's holy priests. In Revelation 20, the righteous are called priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years during the millennial time at the end of the world. If the Spirit of God lives in you, you are a priest. You may not always feel like it or look like it, but you are. In verse 24, Jesus said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The old covenant had been fulfilled and would be set aside the visual manifestation of the Holy Spirit occurred in Acts 2, and you know all about that. Then on stage to stage 4 in verse 25, the woman explained, exclaimed, I know the Messiah will come, the one who is called the Christ. The woman believed what Jesus said, and her heart was completely changed in that moment. The old had passed away, and all became new. She wanted to tell anyone who would listen about it. This Samaritan woman was one of the very first evangelists. The women's meeting with Jesus at the well changed her life forever right then. At this point, the disciples came back with the food, a little, little shocked to see that Jesus was conversing with a woman. The disciples would have had contact in at the store in town, too, of the Samaritans, but we, we don't know how that all went. They said nothing to Jesus about his talk with the woman. 
they may have sensed that he was speaking words of life to her and sometimes silence is golden. I wish I had realized that a little earlier in my life. Oh, stage 5, verse 29, the Samaritan woman forgot about the physical water, went to town and invited everyone to meet the one who knew all about her and could offer living water to all. And these were the very same people who had shunned her earlier. In verse 34, Jesus declined the food and instead gave a short sermon about the harvest of souls in the world. Verse 39, and many of the Samaritans in that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. What a story this is. We don't know exactly how many people believed and how many people they witnessed to in turn, but it was many, says verse 41. God can use anyone, even a woman of low estate and probably questionable reputation. The Samaritans invited Jesus to stay a couple more days, and he did. All of this happened because of the faithful, faithful witness of one person, Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, there it is, and to the end of the earth. Being witnesses is Christ's command to his disciples to tell others about him everywhere, regardless of the consequences. The news of the grace and mercy that Jesus had extended to this Samaritan woman traveled far and wide. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Cultural differences had melted away in the light of Jesus' love. The Jews of that day taught that to approach God, one first had to be a Jew. By including the story of the woman at the well, John demonstrates that the good news is for all people of the world, Jew and Gentile alike. Verse 42, Then they, the people of this village, said to the Samaritan woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. That is a term used only twice in all of the word. So, what can we take away from this story of the Samaritan woman? It's simply this, and you can refer to verses 36 through 38 about that. We did not, re we did not read those verses this morning. It is just simply this. We will receive our rewards in heaven someday. But for now, the wages Jesus offers are the joy of working for him and seeing the harvest of believers. The wages come to both those who plant, those who water, and those who harvest the souls, like Edward Kimball that day in the shoe store. We are commanded to take the gospel to the world. That command has never been rescinded. And I leave you with this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you for the reason of the hope that lies within you. And that's something we can all do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of the woman at the well. We thank you for the story of, of uh, Dwight Moody, Lord. Just help us to be aware of those around us that maybe do not know you or who are struggling in their faith. And just help us to be faithful to you in that regard. And so we just pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.